members in our community here. He did his undergrad and master's work at U of T. And then he also, uh, he went across the pond and did his PhD at Oxford. Um, and we were very happy to lure him back recently. Uh, he joined U of T and Vector this past academic year. So started up in September of 2020. And Chris has done all kinds of, of great research uh, in optimization, probability and statistics, uh, sampling, work in applications. Like he's well known for work in like AlphaGo and code generation. And in general, lots of interesting work on so-called structured learning problems. So uh, yeah, so very happy to have uh, Chris joining us uh, both in general and today for his talk. So take it away, Chris. Thanks, Rich. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, so I'm going to try to do this in not too much time, and hopefully we won't go too far over. Um, OK, so today I'm going to talk to you about a paper that we presented at NeurIPS uh, just in December. And can everybody see my screen? Is that me? Yes, I see some nods. OK, great. So actually, this paper is a continuation of uh, a line of work that I spoke uh, about at my previous uh, field seminar. I don't remember exactly when that was, but a few years back. And this was the motivation that I gave in the last uh, time I was speaking here from the Fields Institute, uh, which is that in the, in the deep learning age, in, in the age of auto, automatic differentiation, this is a sort of typical workflow of an engineer working at a research lab like DeepMind or Google Brain. Um, so they'll be working with some set of data. They'll be working to either clean the data or code up a model that they want to try out. And they implement this in uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch. And then they rely on TensorFlow or PyTorch to compute the derivatives of some loss function for their model. And they run some optimization. And inevitably, something doesn't work. Uh, and they work really hard to figure out why it doesn't work. Was it a bug in the model? Was it a hyperparameter selection, et cetera? Then they go back to the, to the servers and they run a bunch of experiments. And again, they rely on uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch to produce reliable derivative computations uh, for their optimization. And then that finally works. And then they put a bunch of work into explaining the results. And so steps two and four here are really critical steps that have completely liberated um, our ability to explore in the space of models to do really elaborate modeling work and in some ways have realized uh, many different dreams um, in statistics and, and machine learning related to things like probabilistic programming where you can just sort of express a modeling desire and have the software package do all of the grunt computation uh, for you. And so if you're able as a researcher to expand the set of operations that have useful derivatives, you can really have an outsized impact on the on, on model development. And so last time when I spoke, uh, I was talking about derivatives for models that have latent categorical random variables. And today we're gonna take one step further and talk about derivatives for models that have latent structured discrete random variables. And I'll say a little bit more about what that means. So just to motivate this a little bit more, there's a lot of discrete structure in data. So um, you might observe handwritten digits just as drawings, um, but you know there's some underlying clustering structure. For example, these are this is an eight and that's a zero, and so on. There might be tree structure uh, in in your data. So if uh, if you observe a sentence, at least in English, um, you know we believe uh, that there's some sort of notion of an underlying parse tree that describes the grammatical structure of that sentence. There's also um, a great deal of network structure that exists in data uh, in our social networks um, and in our social lives. And there's also a great deal of structure in, in genetic data and biomedical data. Um, a simple example would be uh, for our genetic data, whether a certain um, sequence contains introns or exons. This um, is some kind of discrete switch for each base pair uh, that that exists in some sense, but might be very difficult to extract. They're very difficult uh, or more expensive to, to extract. And so this is one example, but in general, uh, this discrete structure can be quite expensive to extract. Uh, and we want automated ways of inferring that discrete structure. 
in addition to inferring uh, an observed discrete structure, structuring our the models themselves with this structure can um, help in many different ways. It can help incorporate certain problem specific, specific constraints, uh, improve generalization, um, and uh, hopefully uh, increase interpretability. So as an example of uh, increasing interpretability, let's consider the following problem below. So this is um, a review of a beer. And this uh, beer review is rated uh, according to its appearance, its aroma, its palate, its taste, and some overall rating. And so when I read this review, you know, pour is a slight tangerine orange and straw yellow. Um, the head is nice and bubbly, but fades very quickly with a little lacing. There are parts of this review that I understand are referring to the appearance, to the aroma, and to the palate, and to the taste. Uh, but if we want to write in, uh, a machine learning system that's able to tell me, oh, in fact, it was the second or the third sentence here, smells like wheat and European hops, a little yeast in there too, that most explains the, the uh, aroma rating. Uh, this is a challenging problem, even, even though you and I are very well aware of the fact that this is the sentence that most describes uh, the aroma. And so you might have a, a machine learning system that's able to read these reviews and predict what a human would have uh, actually rated as the aroma, but in fact, telling it what sentence was most responsible for that aroma um, rating is, is a challenging thing for many machine learning systems today, especially in the age of uh, deep learning when the uh, uh, models are highly unstructured. So let's unpack that problem a little bit more and talk about one way you might solve it. Uh, today uh, with deep learning. So here I've sort of written out a little cartoon of a potential model. Uh, this model takes in the review on the left, passes it through some sort of neural network, which I'll call an encoder. And in this specific explainer model, it's going to predict a subset of the words of the review uh, that most explain some prediction rating. Uh, and it's then going to pass that subset of words into a decoder CNN uh, to produce this, uh, this prediction rating. And if you optimize this whole uh, network end to end, hopefully the latent set of words that it picks are the ones that most explain uh, the specific uh, rating. So for example, um, you could imagine having trained up a model and um, it, when it picked its subset of words, it's picked you know, smells like wheat and European hops as, the, as one of the segments that most explains um, the aroma. Okay, but so that's just a, a motivating example. And more generally, we might be interested in considering, uh, not just might be interested, in fact, many models that we use today in machine learning have this basic structure of some input, an encoder, some latent um, unobserved random variable X, a decoder, and then an output. So this is a very common uh, pattern in, in machine learning models. And we might be interested in, in the specific case where the latent variable X is a random binary array that has some kind of specific structure. So for example, you might uh, think of X as being a binary array that is so-called one hot. So here uh, X is uh, an array of zero ones. And in these little cartoons, this little pink or red represents a one and white represents zeros. So this is a vector that has one of its elements on uh, as a one and every other element to zero. Or you might want uh, your latent variables x to be restricted to be k dot, um, as in the previous example where we picked a subset of k words. Or you might get even more elaborate and say, I want my random binary array to represent a permutation matrix uh, where the rows and the columns sum to one. Or maybe you want this to represent a spanning tree uh, that describes some structure in your data, or the spanning tree of a directed graph, which is an R essence. And you know, the, uh, you get very creative with these sort of structures that you might want to impose in your latent space. And in these, in models that are structured in this way, what we typically want to do is optimize an expected loss. So the expectation of some loss function over the output, where the expectation is basically taken over the randomness in the in the latent variable x. And we'd like to optimize this with respect to the parameters of the whole network. But the challenge, uh, you know, the, the, the parameters of the decoder are typically easy uh, to optimize. And the, the real challenge in this setting is to optimize the parameters of the encoder. And this is because it requires computing estimators of the gradient 
with respect to the parameters theta of this expected value. And so if you've sort of been following deep learning for the uh, um, for the last little while, you'll you'll recognize this word backpropagation, which is just sort of a fancy way to say um, uh, um, efficient algorithms that use the chain rule to compute the derivatives of the parameters um, of some composition of differentiable functions. And so the natural question if you're in deep learning is to say, well, okay, I want to compute an estimator of this expected value. Is there some way that I can use uh, backpropagation to compute such an estimator? Unfortunately, in the setting that we're considering, computing de derivatives is difficult, even, uh, even with uh, efficient algorithms for uh, taking derivatives through compositions of differentiable functions. And the essential problem is that x here is random, and um, existing generic approaches for this uh, that, um, that actually don't use backpropagation through the first half uh, exhibit high variance and are not useful in practice unless you do some clever tricks. And even then, they can be very challenging to tune. And the low variance approaches that have become very popular in the last couple of years, in fact, don't apply to discrete random variables x and only to continuous ones. So last time when I talked to you, uh, I was talking um, in particular about the so-called Gumbel softmax, which resolves this problem for categorical one-hot random variables. And the basic idea here is to say, well, we previously had a discrete random variable that didn't admit these low variance uh, approaches to computing gradients. And so perhaps we can just relax the discrete random variable to a random continuous random variable x sub t that admits a biased pathwise gradient, which is that low variance approach. Well, this approach is called the Gumbel softmax um, because this soft x is soft relative to the hard x. And it's now broadly used um, across generative models and, and in some places in reinforcement learning. And it has in some settings in sort of piecemeal ways been generalized to structured random variables. So there was the original Gumbel softmax, uh, which was published in 2017. And there have been some sort of bespoke uh, uh, ways to relax k-hot random variables um, published a, couple, a year or two later. And there have been some uh, approaches for computing relaxations of random permutation matrices, uh, which was published in 2018. But there hasn't been a sort of uh, coherent framework to capture these, uh, these relaxations uh, and this, this technique for training uh, discrete structured latent variable models. So the paper that I'm going to talk to you about today, it was the paper that we published at NERITS in, in 2020 which we called stochastic softmax tricks. And stochastic softmax tricks are a generalized framework that uh, generalize the Gumbel softmax. They generalize some of the uh, estimators that um, I mentioned in the previous slide, but they include new relaxations and uh, have, are sort of a coherent framework for generating relaxations for new structured, uh, new structures that might not have been published in the literature until now. So it captures existing ones, uh, generates new relaxations as well as uh, new possibilities for structuring your discrete spaces. So this is the sort of main idea, and I'll go through this uh, one more time with mathematical symbols. The main idea is to reparameterize the discrete sampling process as a random linear program. Um, and this, in fact, generalizes an approach for sampling from categorical random variables known as the Gumbel max trick. Then you relax the linear program to a convex program uh, in fact, a strongly convex program, uh, which creates that sort of softening of the, of the random variable, which allows you to compute pathwise gradient estimators. So I'll go through this one more time uh, with symbols and with pictures. So the first step is to take your random variable x and reparameterize it as the solution to a random linear program. So what does that mean? Um, here it is in pictures. So we imagine that our uh, uh, random variable x takes on some finite set of values. Here I'm showing um, a, a one hot random variable with five possible states. We reparameterize the sampling process for x as a, a, a random linear program that is, the animation is totally bizarre, sorry about that, um, uh, that is simulated by sampling a random utility. So there's going to be some distribution u over a random utility u that you choose. And then 
we let x be the solution of a rent of the linear program um, imposed by that choice of uh, u. So here uh, the pictures are below, and here are the symbols. So we have some finite set uh, calligraphic x, and we solve this linear program over calligraphic x with a random utility. Because u is random, this dis induces a distribution over calligraphic x, which will be our random variable. Okay, as it stands, this doesn't fully solve our problem because this R of max operation uh, is a hard discrete operation um, and doesn't admit, well, it admits pathwise gradients, but they're, it's not correct in the sense that they're not actually, uh, they don't form unbiased estimates uh, of the gradient that we're actually interested in. So this is by itself not a complete solution but it's partway there. So these so-called stochastic argmax tricks recover categorical sampling in the one hot case. Um, so to do this, you sample this utility with a certain distribution, which is a Gumbel distribution with a location parameter theta. And then you compute the argmax, which is the solution of the, of the linear program over the one hot vectors x. And you get a random one hot vector x uh, that is distributed according to the Gibbs distribution described by theta. Whoops, skip something there. But this idea generalizes to more structured settings. So for example, if you're interested in producing a spanning tree, uh, a random spanning tree, you could do that by sampling random edge utilities. And we'll collect these into the upper diagonal, uh, upper, upper triangle of a matrix uh, um, with, that represents the edges in a graph. And so you could sample a, a random edge utility for each edge, and then push those edge utilities through Kruskal's algorithm to solve the linear program for the spanning trees. And this would impose some distribution over the spanning trees of X. Of course, we can only really do this in practice uh, for structured spaces that have efficient linear solvers. That's something that we assume uh, when we uh, actually implement this thing. Okay, so as I mentioned, it, it wasn't enough uh, to solve the linear program and to sort of try to take derivatives through that because the solution has uh, derivatives that are zero with respect to uh, um, the parameters of u. Uh, and so the idea behind stochastic softmax tricks is to incorporate a strongly convex regularizer that relaxes the discrete x into a continuous xt. And so by adding uh, uh, a term to the, this inner optimization problem, we can drive the solutions of the linear program, which lived at the vertices of a polytope, into the relative interior of that polytope. And so here is the. Uh, uh, a little animation below. So you have this random utility that is describing a distribution uh, or imposing a distribution over the vertices of some polytope. Um, and by adding a convex regularizer, and that's X, and by adding a convex regularizer, it pushes the solution into the relative interior uh, or into the convex hull uh, of these, uh, 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 of the discrete states of your um, system. Okay, and the whole point of doing this is that if uh, this uh, convex function that you add to this inner optimization problem is strongly convex, you can prove that uh, now x sub t admits a useful pathwise gradient uh, that you can use to compute unbiased estimates of, of the gradient of the, of the expected loss function of the relaxed graph. And so this, in fact, recovers the Gumbel softmax case uh, in the one hot, uh, in the one hot case. And so here uh, we have on the right the uh, one hot reparameterization that we discussed earlier, where you sample a bunch of gumballs and take their argmax. And instead of taking their argmax, you can take a, a, a sort of tempered softmax of these random uh, utilities to get the gumball softmax. But this basic idea can be generalized to other structure X. So again, we had these spanning trees which were uh, random spanning trees uh, computed using Kruskal's algorithm from random edge utilities. Well, it turns out that you can compute some of these convex solutions to these convex regularizations uh, using a, a, a result in enumerative combinatorics called Kirchhoff's matrix free theorem. And so you can get soft spanning trees that are random through which you can take these pathwise gradients. And of course, again, we have to assume that that we have efficient solvers uh, that are available for whatever given convex regularizer that we've chosen and calligraphic X, which is the set of possible states of, of the random variable X. 
Um, but luckily, this is a problem that is, is well studied in convex optimization and in graphical models. Uh, and, uh, and so we lean very heavily on that existing literature. Okay, so now I'll tell you a little bit about what are we doing for time? Um, about the experiments that we did. Terribly. Okay, that's fine. Um, we trained these stochastic softmax tricks uh, with deep latent variable models over structured discrete domains. And I had intended, uh, oh dear, um, intended to tell you about two, but I'll just tell you about one. Okay, so. I'll tell you about our experiments on graph layout, which are very visually pleasing. So uh, our graph layout experiments were performed in, um, in a framework that was published in 2018 called the Neural Relational Inference uh, Framework. In this framework, uh, this is again in this structure where we have an encoder and a decoder. And this framework is used to model uh, interacting particle systems. And so, we imagine that our data is some system of particles here uh, uh, visualized with these little colored dots, which form a time series. So uh, you can imagine this little particle evolving over time. And here's the sort of uh, trajectory as a shadow. Um, but what you don't know about this time series, or at least what the model doesn't observe, is that some of these particles actually have some interaction dynamics, which can be uh, explained in an interaction graph. Right, so here uh, the orange particle and the blue particle have some interaction that's described by an edge between them in some discrete structured graph. Um, and these models are trained in, in exactly uh, the framework that we discussed where the interaction graph itself is latent and unobserved. And the output is um, a reconstruction of the observation itself. And we can consider uh, models in this framework that impose varying degrees of structure on the inter interaction graph itself. So we can assume that the interaction graph ha has a distribution, which is sampling a bunch of independent edges. This is what was uh, assumed in the neural relational inference paper. Or we could imagine that, that the interaction graph is restricted to have some kind of sparsity constraint. So here in the middle, I'm considering a setting where uh, we have uh, we restrict the graph to have exactly uh, the number of nodes minus one edges, but no other structure. Or it could be a spanning tree uh, over the nodes, which shares the sparsity constraint uh, of the middle column here, but has additional structure, which uh, requires that the edges form a spanning tree of the graph. So you can imagine wanting to impose additional structure on this interaction. Group. And we tested it on uh, some toy data which uh, was data generated from a force-directed algorithm for laying out a graph. Okay, so we took a bunch of random spanning trees, laid them out in two dimensions uh, using this force-directed algorithm, and we let the model observe the trajectory of the nodes uh, where they were laid out in, uh, in two-dimensional space, but not the edges between them. Okay, so the, the model only observed the locations of each of these gray dots, uh, which were generated using an underlying spanning tree structure, which uh, are the edges. And the goal of the model is to model this data, but also to recover the underlying spanning tree. And while perhaps unsurprisingly, what we found is that as you imposed more structure on the model itself, uh, uh, it did better and better at structure recovery. So on the left is a ground truth graph for one of the one of the and, and a ground truth graph laid out in two dimensions. And then uh, for each uh, of the other three columns on the right, we are showing the locations of the particles according to the ground truth, but edges sampled from the from the encoder now. And so independent edges effectively predicts all sorts of jumbled edges. Uh, the sparsity constraint does a poor job of recovering uh, the spanning tree. Um, and when you impose a spanning tree structure, uh, it successfully uh, recovers the spanning tree. And this is reflected um, both in precision and recall of the edges, as well as the, the objective that we trained on, which was the evidence lower bound, which was a standard objective in, in, in this sort of framework. Okay, so I'll just skip more useful experiments ahead to the conclusion. 
so I talked a little bit about gradient estimation with stochastic softmax tricks. They generalize a very uh, widespread and useful um, idea, which is called the Gumbel softmax. And in particular, they generalize it to structured spaces. Uh, they admit novel relaxations for new combinatorial objects, and they give a unified perspective on uh, both existing reparameterizations uh, and relaxations. So I am happy to take questions for anyone who's still around. Okay, thanks a lot, Chris. That was great. Uh, anybody have I, questions? I have a question. Um, in the original Gumbach, uh, Gumbel Softmax paper and supplementary material, uh, you discussed some issues with the numerical um, stability due to the log of flog. Uh, could you expand on that? Is that a limitation that you observed in different frameworks? Outside of VAE, VAE, I know that there was a very specific solution to that. In the Gumbel Softmax, the, the log of log, uh... Not sure there is a log of log that leads to some uh, numerical instability. In practice, if you try to just plug it in, uh, I observed it and it was also mentioned in the supplementary material that it could is lead to. The, is this the gumbel when you sample the gumbels themselves? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's because uniforms, random numbers in uh, floating point sometimes return exactly zero. And, and so you just have to make sure it doesn't return exactly zero. So I, I think it's because of the log of the probability uh, and oh, that's the sample it itself re requires uh, a log of the, uh, of the sample. So you end up having a log of a log in, your, in, your, in the computational graph. Uh -huh. uh, I'm not sure I remember this problem. Maybe we'll take, we could take that offline. Uh, I'd be happy to okay, thank you. answer an email or ping me on Slack. There's a question on the chat from Amir Masood says, what's the effect of the regularizer on the bias of your derivatives when T isn't going to zero? Is any particular choice better? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Um, can't, oh, there, I've opened the chat. Yeah, that's a great chat question. Uh, as far as I know, no one has done a very comprehensive study of this. Um, so this work is related to line of work that's that's popular right now in natural language processing, which looks at the sort of deterministic version of these relaxations. And for any given polytope, they're, you know, I mean, when I said strongly convex for this regularizer, I mean, there's sort of any possible choice, right? So um, as far as I know, no one has done anything particularly comprehensive to understand uh, how you should choose F. And I have some suspicions. Um, so one question is the bias. The other question is how sort of useful that gradient is in some sense for the learning process. And I suspect that the harder it is to compute this relaxed, the solution of the relaxed problem, the more information is contained in the gradient. And the reason I suspect that is it, you can think of an extreme setting. So in, in, in the most extreme setting, you have the matching polytope and you're using the convex regularizer, which is the entropy that would give you the Gibbs distribution um, over all of the possible matchings. Computing that relaxation is sharp P complete because it's, it, it reduces to, to a computing a permanent. And, uh, and uh, on the other hand, you can compute, uh, you can compute, um, you can compute using Sinkhorn iterations for a different con convex regularizer. And so there's some kind of spectrum here uh, in terms of how easy it or not is to compute. And at the extreme case, these sort of dense relaxations that are generated by uh, these entropies, in some sense, contain information about every vertex of the polytope, right? at least up to, you know, whether it's sharp P or not, right? Uh, or or what, you know, up to some complexity issues, they somehow contain information about every vertex. And that has to be powerful information when you're getting these gradients. That was just very vague kind of intuition about this idea that uh, uh, you know the, the more sort of dense the relaxation is, probably the better the gradients are, but the harder it is to compute. At the other extreme end is uh, the Euclidean projection, where you can change the utility without changing the solution. OK, I don't know if that answers your question. It was just a bunch of vague intuitions. But I think it's an interesting question. Let me ask you a high level question, Chris. So 
Um, and this relates to the what you were saying about the discrete structures. I'm interested in the range of kind of discrete structures that you can use here. And I assume you need some sort of combinatorial algorithm as a workhorse to, to, to make this work. And so, for example, I was thinking, could you have imposed the idea that your latent structure is a directed acyclic graph um, and be able to solve uh, over versions of that? Uh, and more generally, like what are the kind, you talked about spanning trees and others, like what's the range of things? Yeah, I think the directed acyclic graph is a great question. So th this came up a little bit when I, this maybe is related to a conversation we've been having, but when I was thinking about whether there was an application in causality here, um, I, and the, the question would be sort of which edges from the complete graph you pick or maybe which direction and you want to impose some kind of directed acyclic constraint. I think it's possible. There's been some work on, on learning DAGs recently that look like they might be generating. Yeah, I think it's possible. I, I haven't thought in specific detail about that one, um, but I'll just say that, yeah, the, the, the basic constraint is that you already have some kind of combinatorial solver for that structure. Um, and, and, but that's just for the sampling plot process of the discrete thing. You then have to worry about going back down to the relaxations. That can get crazy, as I was alluding to with these with matching polytope. But typically, you can at the very least do the Euclidean projections, uh, even if it might be expensive. So if you have uh, the, the combinatorial solver, you can usually at least do the Euclidean projections. Um, so yeah, I don't okay, great. Really answer your question, but it, it, it's sort of a case by case answer. Excellent, thanks. So are there any other questions out there? I don't think so. Okay, well, thanks so much for the, the excellent talk and uh...